Hey everyone, thank you again for coming to my session. Today we are going to talk about uh, you know Scupper as a modernization enabler. Scupper is an open source project which helps you connect services across different environments. We'll talk about it later, but before that, my name is Vamsi Ravala. I'm a technical marketing manager at Red Hat, taking care of the application development uh, services and the portfolio of products around it. So when you when you think about you know, application modernization, migration. There are certain common migration patterns or modernization patterns that come to mind, right? And even if you, some of you who are aware of Martin Fowler's book might have looked at these. One, we have lift and shift where you leave the architecture alone but modernize the deployment platform itself. The second one is refactor, augment, and extend where, you know, you're building new capabilities, keeping the original stuff as it is and building new capabilities in terms of microservices uh, and having well-defined APIs and, you know, interacting with the older systems, etc. And the other type of modernization pattern that, that is there is, you know, rewrite and replace, you know, replacing existing functionality, rewriting the whole thing and, and all those different stuff, right? So, again, this session is, we are not going to go deep into how we do the modernization and all that, but talk about one aspect of modernization or one key aspect that we need to think when we are modernizing or migrating our applications to different environments. And, and as you know, if you do a big bang rewrite and big bang migration of all your services at once, all you are guaranteed is a big bang. You know, just, just, just imagine, right, on a Friday evening you are trying to migrate everything and everything goes down, you know, we have been there, seen that and, and recently a lot of bad experiences for some bigger companies. But, but really, uh, when you think about modernizing the application, uh, and especially when you're trying to hollow out a monolithic application, uh, you know, again, this, some of this might be a little repetitive to what you've heard before, right? But, but it's essentially about when you think about breaking down the monolithic application into smaller microservices, breaking the functionality you really need to take the time that is needed. It's, it's, it should be a very gradual approach. And when you start building your, breaking down your applications into these individual blocks, you need to take time. And when you, when, when you do it over a period of time, it really becomes, and when you, when you break down the microservices, uh, there, is, there is a situation where you might want to deploy these different components, like you see the boxes here. There is, there is a situation where you might want to, you know, deploy all these different microservices in different environments, right? You might want to deploy a couple of microservices or functionalities on, say, OpenShift, a couple of things on Kubernetes, a couple of things on bare metal, and you might have some legacy APIs that you can't move or migrate from the legacy systems like mainframe. Think about financial industry. They really don't want to migrate off mainframe, right? But they want to build new functionality somewhere else, say on AWS, OpenShift Managed, or, or anywhere else, or in their own private data center. So when you have such a mirror of different systems where different components of your applications are sitting, connectivity becomes a key to successful modernization or migration. So when you're thinking about connectivity, you need to think about a couple of things, right? You know, first, when you are moving from point environment A to environment B, the traffic switch over for services running on the legacy to modern platforms must be disruption free with, with almost zero downtime. And you know the connectivity, as I mentioned, if there are some legacy platforms, need to be maintained until all the components or services are migrated. If they are not migrated, this connectivity needs to be there. And, and, and that's where, you know, Scupper really helps, right? Scupper is a, a layer seven connectivity product, which, which, which is open source, of course. You can check it out at scupper.io, but what it really does is it helps you connect services that are distributed across multiple environments. And it does not by creating complex VPNs. I mean, the next slide actually you'll see what are the alternatives to Scupper, right? You could either have public IP networks and then connect your applications, which is a very expensive and not so secure thing. Or you could use large cloud provider based networks like AWS VPC. 
but again in those scenarios you are stuck on the cloud provider itself you don't really have the capability of putting your microservices or the functionality in different environments or you could set up your set up a vpn network vpn network is very secure uh, very doable but but again the challenge with vpn network is just think about a developer developing a new functionality wanting it to connect it to some other app or some other service somewhere else but raising a ticket to the networking being saying hey i need you to set up a vpn for me to do this to connect and that takes a week or 10 days or 15 days to set up that vpn and you know the whole complexity around that it's it's a really time consuming and stops the velocity of a developer if you will right so what what scupper really does is it it tries to build this networking or connectivity on layer 7 it's what we called an overlay network by overlay network what we really mean is you know whatever connectivity or rules or network rules you have on all the layers below layer 7 it will respect all that but it will build a networking infrastructure on top of it at layer 7 so how the addressing works is when you when when you create a virtual application network we we the category of network that we build using scupper is called virtual application network when you build such network you refer to these services you give them addresses the addresses are not dependent on the ip addresses itself you give them certain names for example you say hey i'll call my payment service service a service payment sir service payment on the network and i'll call my database service database on the network and that is the only reference that different all the different components that connect to these services will use so even if the underlying ip address changes and the name remains the same on the scupper network the 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 consumer application or the consumer uh, microservice will be able to access this irrespective of you know just just take an example right you have you have a service which the pod has restarted when the pod has restarted the ip address of the pod changes but in, in if it's a part of the scupper network and if it's given a you know an, a name the name doesn't change and even if the ip address changes the connectivity is still retained and that really makes the network portable and it also has multicast and anycast capabilities meaning if there are multiple instances of the same service say uh, deployed across it will either load balance it and, or if one fails the other takes over automatically and you don't need to do any additional configuration you just need to add all these same instances with the same name on the network and uh, when it comes to security the communication between the different scupper sites is mtls encrypted uh, and it is also very easy to tear down the network if you don't need it at some point and it doesn't leave any residue and and we are talking about building these connections within a couple of minutes and and we'll try to do that live today right you know demo gods permitting we'll try to do that live today we'll 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 take a couple of minutes to build the connectivity and and see how see kind of the migration journey of an application and and how we go through that right so how does we we've seen the theoretical part how does uh, it uh, what is it right we'll we'll see how it works so imagine an environment sorry i'm not able to point out to the screen behind me because it's in front of me but but imagine you have a data center an edge vm and a public uh, cloud and there is the red box there is an application that wants to access the service in the data a specific service in the data center and the edge and the data center do not allow any inbound connections or ingress so how can these applications access this service the one in the data center it's in the same network it can directly access no issues there right but what about the service in the application in the public environment and the application in the edge environment so we will use scupper for that so first what we do is we install something called scupper routers and again this is done using a cli command utility tool uh, we just do a scupper in it and it will initialize scupper in both these environments this router works very similar to your layer 3 routers as in it knows what is the destination of the different services so as you keep connecting routers they'll form a mesh of routers where each other knows okay which router owns this particular service and its route routes to that router and that router in return will send it back so how do we connect after installing the routers right so in the public environment we create something called a token 
the token has information about connectivity, has information about the TLS certificate that we'll use for the connectivity, and you will use that, and the data center will use that token to establish a connection between the routers. And once the connection is established, and if you look at the direction of the connection, it is from the data center to the public cloud. But once the connection is established, it becomes a bi-directional network. So they can exchange the information. So now the database, was, which, which was not allowing any ingress, can exclusively communicate with the, with the scupper router in the, public, in the public data center. So, and, and also with scupper, you have the, you have the control to say, hey, I only want to expose a specific service over the network using the scupper expose command. So once you do that, hey, you can tell scupper, hey, just expose this service in the black box over the network. It will create a virtual service in, in the public environment that the application will call. And the application in the public environment doesn't really know where the actual service sits, right? So even if the service moves from the data center to data center two or data center three, and if it's a part of all those data centers are a part of the network, they will, this application will still be able to talk to the service, right? Now what about the edge VM? The edge VM wants to talk to the service in the data center, but the data center and edge both don't allow ingress in this case. So there is an indirect way to establish the connection. So if you see here, the same, the edge, edge VM will establish a connection with public, the same uh, way that it has done, the same way data center has done with the public, but, and it forms a bi-directional network. But since edge is connected to public, and public is connected to data center, the edge VM finds, uh, finds this indirect path to the data center to connect to the service and then because all of these routers are a part of the mesh, that virtual service appears in the edge data center for the application to communicate. So that's, that's in essence how Scupper really works. And let's, let's try to see a little bit of a demo, right? Now I have a, I have a, 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 a patient portal application. So, so think about the migration use cases that we've spoken, right? I've had a monolithic patient portal application which shows a list of patients and I can go, uh, as a patient, I can log into that portal and make a payment, right? That's, that's the scenario, but uh, we've actually broken down that application into three different components as a part of the modernization migration journey and put the front end on OpenShift and retain the database and the payment service on a RHEL 9 data center. Again, this can be any Kubernetes or any VM, but just for the demo purposes, I'm using RHEL and OpenShift, right? And I'm going to establish the connection using Scupper here. So let me let me just show you first the patient portal. So currently you don't see a list of patients, a list of doctors or anything here, right? Because we have not yet established the connection. So what I will do here is you know pull up my little cheat sheet and try to make the connection between the rel machine and my OpenShift front end. So this is this is what we are going to do right now. This blue line is, is where we are going to establish the connectivity. So I've, I've already inst initialized the router just, just for the uh, you know, interest of time in, in, the, in my AWS cluster. And if you look at it, oh gosh, it's so difficult. To <laughs> the orange color is the AWS cluster. The blue color, and I've written there too, the Azure cluster, and the red color is where I'm logged into the VM. So these are my different environments, right? So when I run commands, uh, you should see that. So I've already installed my uh, router here. I'm going to install the router in the rel machine. We'll, I'll, currently we won't use the Azure for the first scenario, but we'll come back to it later. But I'm going to initialize the router in my rel machine. So if you look at it, the scupper init command will initialize the router. And uh, now we have two routers. What happened here? <laughs> Usually happens. Connectivity issue. It should not be, but let's see. All right, let's see. It's still okay. Was it was it there in the last session too, the connectivity issues? 
okay it's it's waiting for status so network guards are uh, with us today hopefully but i'm initializing the routers and and you can see i've initialized routers in the rel machine they're running as containers there and i'm also initi i've also initialized routers in my aws cluster here you can see the different couple components that are installed here and once i've installed the routers i'm going to create the token as i mentioned in the aws openshift cluster where my front end is copper token create okay sorry i've copied something else yeah all right so i've created the token and now i'm going to transfer the token to my rel machine ideally you can use a certificate management tool or a wall to manage the tokens but just for the demo purposes i'm transferring the token which I don't think you should be doing did I? And this is the password for it. Sometimes you copy more than that's needed and all right. So we've copied the token. I think we have the token here. Yes, we have the token. And if you guys want to have a quick look at the token, let me let me just see. Show me the components. So you have the, the certificate information in the token. You have where it should connect in order, in order to make the connection with the router and all that details in the token itself. So now what we will do is we will use the scupper link create command to create the token, to create the connection between the routers. And now we have the link, right? Now ideally, okay, we have the link. Let's go back to the patient portal and see. It's not working still because we have not told scupper Though the network is there, we have not told it which services I want to expose over the network. So I'm going to explicitly go and say, hey, expose, I'm running, I'm, I'm running both of them as containers, right? On my rel, using Podman, I'm, I'm running both my database and payment processor as containers. So I'm going to say, hey, expose both these services that are running onto the scupper network using the scupper expose command that, that you will see here. So I'm putting that in my rel machine. And I'll go back to my AWS to create that proxy uh, services. Sometimes this the services can get created automatically, but I've disabled that because you, uh, I want to have control on what I want to name the services in the destination, right? So I'm going to create this that virtual services in my AWS environment. And uh, now, if it doesn't work, then I have to I have some work to do, right? There you go. Now we have connected the database, the list of patients is coming and now when I go to a patient and try to pay a bill, you can see the payment is processed at the data center. So that's one scenario, right? I'm connecting the and we've established the connection between OpenShift cluster, a data center within what, five minutes. If the network was there, it would have taken two to three minutes. So now, what about high availability and failover? Again, when you're modernizing, migrating the application, when you're distributing it, you need to think about high availability and failover across these different clouds. What if one cloud fails? What's the, what if service in one cloud fails? How do you take care of it, right? So here's the scenario, right? Now let's bring Azure into the picture. I've put one instance of my payment service on Azure. I have another instance of the payment service on uh, while I explain it, let me just initialize the terminal so that we can see the load balancing thing. Yes. So I have one instance of the payment service on Azure, one instance on the VM, and I was, I'm going to establish the connection between Azure and AWS using Scupper the same way that we did it. And once we've done that, uh, when I send a load, a bunch of requests, Scupper will automatically load balance between these two instances. How does it know these are, it should load balance between these two instances? Because on the Scupper network, I will give this service and this service the same name. So the local service in the AWS cluster will point to these two different, will know that there are two different instances of it. So let's go ahead and actually do that. Uh, Let's try to establish the connection between Azure and AWS because we've already established the connection between RHEL and AWS. So I'm going to create a token in AWS. 
right we have the token created there and let me initialize the router in Azure I should have done that before the thing but but hey it'll take a few seconds yeah and then I will use the token to create the link I'm, I'm not going to explain again what I'm doing with Azure because it's very similar with what we've done with establishing a connection between the rel machine and the and the AWS cluster so let's just wait let's just wait and we can actually see as the things are being installed in the Azure cluster when we give the scupper in it and uh, you know these are two different clusters right uh, just for, for us understanding I've also put that in the URL you can see it's Azure and the one without anything is AWS so once we have the router installed in Azure let's try to create the link between Azure and AWS again the scupper link create command and then you use the token to create the link and then finally you expose the payment processor over the network and one thing you need to observe here is I'm giving it the same name as I've as I have given the other payment processor so if you look at the address part here we call it payment processor I've given the same name to the payment processor when I exposed it from rel and that is really the key here so expose and now what we'll try to do is I'll try to first I'll make around 100 concurrent calls to the payment service from the AWS cluster and see how the calls are getting distributed or if, if, if the calls are getting distributed at all right again I want you to think about all these from an app modernization migration scenario where again you're distributing this you need to take care about high availability and uh, failover load balancing and all that so let me go back to my AWS cluster I have an inbuilt terminal here and let me just try to run this so basically the results will be stored uh, the process that data center and process that pay payment processed at Azure will be saved in both these uh, files and if you look at it out of the hundred calls 52 were sent to the data center and 48 were sent to the Azure it was it's almost 50 50 load balanced so that you know scupper is making sure that you know it is not crowding one service and if it sees there's an there is another service available it will automatically send traffic to it and that's how it's taking care of the load balancing stuff again remember you're not explicitly configuring any load balancing stuff all you're doing is telling the network that hey this is the you're giving it the same name on the network and that's how it knows there are two instances all right now that we've done the load balancing part what if in case of failover if, if the payment service in the data center goes down will scupper redirect it to the one in the Azure automatically or should we do anything extra it will actually do it automatically and we can we can actually see that live let's try to have some time yeah let's try to kill the payment processor that's kind of a wild move but let's try it let's try to kill the payment processor in the in the the real data center right basically I'm killing the pod here and let's see if uh, you know the payment processor there automatically takes over so let me go back to my application and try to make a payment for another patient and when you see first time when you saw it was payment processed at data center and now it's payment processed at Azure now all the payments will be processed at Azure because I've taken down the container you have a question okay you want me to zoom this probably it's better sorry I should have thought about it but so now you see the payment is being processed at Azure the instance in Azure is is serving this because copper is taking care of the whole hey I know this is down but I know there is another instance I will redirect to it because they are both the same according to me so that's 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 another use case of scupper and again from a modernization context you're taking care of failover when you're taking care of connectivity itself right now to the last use case right cloud connectivity resilience what if imagine a scenario where you know the connection between uh, for, for some reason the network connection between AWS and Azure is, is weak and and your payment service you're not the payment 
AWS scupper router is not able to reach the scupper router in the Azure because that's the only place that we have the payment processor right now. So the network is down. That means the link is broken. The scupper link is broken. How do these, how, how do I make the connectivity now? So what scupper also does is, we've seen in our first example on how scupper works. So in our example, what we'll do is, we'll try to connect the Azure to data center now. And then AWS is already connected to data center. So scupper, when, when, you, when, the, when the front end wants to access the payment processor, it will go from the data center to the Azure because it realizes the network is out here. It takes that indirect path because it knows there is an indirect path to reach that particular router because all these routers behave as a mesh. So let us try to see that again. And, and this is a mistake in the diagram. We've already <laughs> taken down the payment service in the data center, so please ignore that. So we're going to establish what we call the indirect connectivity. So let's let's go ahead and do that then first. Uh, where is my cheat sheet? Yeah. So first I'm going to delete the link between Scupper and Azure and AWS. Just imagine that the network connection or the pipeline between AWS and Azure connectivity has broken, right? With the things. So I've deleted that connection. And then now what I'll do is I'll try to connect I mean, ideally, you won't try to connect after the link breaks, but now I'm, I'm connecting Azure to the RHEL machine so that we can see how the indirect connectivity works. So for that, I'm going to create a token in the Azure network. Transfer that to the RHEL machine. Password. And then we use the scupper link create command to create that link that we've seen between Azure and the real environment here. Right. So our setup is done. So basically what we've done is we've built this connection. And this connection was already there. And now we will check if the indirect connection from AWS to data center to Azure is actually working. Go ahead, please. Correct. Sure. Uh, so the, my, my statement was, wouldn't the scenario have been a bit different? You wouldn't have established the connection from Azure into the data center because before we had said, like, ingress into the data center wasn't something we would have allowed. So we would have made Correct. the connection from the data center to Azure, and then that would have created. I mean, I, I, I still get how it would have been the, yeah. the same flow of, of setup, but it would have been Actually, from the point. REL side to Azure, right? Actually, good point, but we are actually making the connection from data center to Azure because the blue terminal, if you see here, we are creating the token in the Azure, and then we are creating the link from the data center, scupper link create from the data center. So it is actually going through that path and not from Azure to the data center. So yes, I, it, it was a little bit hurried, so my apologies there. I, I understand, but yeah, yeah, but, but that's, that's a great point, but I'm glad that we both are aligned there. So let's let's go back. Let's let's try to make a payment for another patient and see if our front end is able to reach the payment processor through this indirect path, right? Oh, this guy has a there you go. Payment process that Azure again is able to reach the payment processor to the indirect path, and that's again uh, how Scupper is taking care. Again, when you when you're thinking about modernization and all those scenarios, when you're distributing your microservices. Uh, as connectivity becomes an important part of it, you need to start thinking about tools that can really take care of such things for you. And that brings me to the end of a session. I think I'm a little early than expected. But I, uh, there are some resources where you can try it out, some labs, uh, the Scupper IO open source website. Uh, very easy to install, get started. Uh, any questions, uh, you know, I, I don't have my email on there I should have had, but I'm happy to take anything over email. But please go ahead. So uh, while the patient portal doesn't seem HIPAA compliant, 
Um, I, I get that the patients were Dunder Mifflin employees, but I didn't catch the doctors. So it's just out of curiosity, who are, who are the list of doctors? Were they also uh, the office employees? or? It's just a sample. We just wanted just to Just random? Okay. Oh, yeah. Doogie Hauser. Okay, yeah. So you got... Yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, so, so the doctor's app is basically for checking their appointments and all that. But we have not, for the basic app, not built the functionality for it. So, so uh, he has a question. Someone? He has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, like, a, as a last demo, you kind of like break one link, and you need to run the command to create a lot of link uh, between the real and uh, the WS. So it's kind of, I, I'm not sure because I didn't see the clearly uh, the command line. So if that's, that's the case, it's just kind of like a, um, the uh, maintenance for admins to, uh, to keep. It's just like uh, always kind of like in this rumbling uh, to create a new link, where's the direction? It's like why it's not before everything's yeah. like interconnect and the link could like automatically decide where to go. So. So, so here's my thought on that, right? For the demo itself, probably a better way to show it, you will, you will never create a new link after one link goes out, right? So typically what happens is you have a central location where the router, where all the sites are connected to, right? And the most reliable place, and that is always in position. So even if one link goes down, the central location is always there to route it. So for the demo purposes, I had to do a little bit of tweaking, but, but typically you're, you're not always monitoring links and saying, hey, if this goes down, I should create this link. Whereas you always have a central location where you have a router that all are connected to, and that will take care of this indirect if some direct link breaks. Any other questions? Yeah, just uh, on the last example, are you able like, let's say a link isn't down, but it's kind of throttled. Or is it, does it automatically adapt? Like, does it figure out, hey, maybe this link, uh, the latency is better. I'm going to reroute this way. Or, or is it only that if it goes down, it tries to reroute? Sorry, I, I uh, you, no, can, you I, can take out some mic. The mic's uh, probably making uh, it worse. Yeah, I just meant, like, if, if a link is down, okay. yeah. it is down, it doesn't matter the latency. Yes, it will, it will take care of that. Uh, and, and also, if you've seen the second example that we've done, right, uh, it's, it's almost a similar example where the, one of the payment processing, that link is throttled, right? And that's why it's kind of distributing. And by default, what you can do is, I've, I've actually set costs to the links between the data center and the Azure. And I said, hey, by default, if it's possible, send all the calls to my data center. So since it realized, in spite of that, since it realized that the data center is being throttled and there's a lot of load, it started load balancing it automatically. So, so that's how it's doing it. And that's why even if you see, just because of the cost I've assigned, a couple of calls more went to the data center versus, versus this, right? So that's, that's the thing. It, it always tries to respect your preference, but if, if, if there is an alternative and if there's throttling, it will load balance it. So you can, you can actually assign, when you initialize the links, when you put, when you, uh, do scupper link and when you create the connections, you can add costs to those links. And that cost will be an indicator on which is your preferred uh, way. Because for example, say, to run a service in AWS might be expensive than running in your own data center because of different reasons or vice versa. And you want by default all calls to go here. You can control that by cost. Yes, question. Please go ahead. The mic's probably making it worse. But it captures the oh, Okay. This, this is Okay, yeah. okay. So uh, the question is related, like a like performance also. It's part like a, uh, what kinds of weakening. Like, like uh, for the deployment, maybe some service could only be deployed like uh, in the real cluster that like uh, under your firewall. It's a lot like a could, like in your case, a uh, payment service could have replica directly in different cloud. And it's just the one point that everything needs to go to that link. And like then it's the thing that how reliable is Scalper itself, like running in, like both of your containers, just for, for the uh, clusters 
in cloud, it's just like a more managed automatically with OpenShift or Kubernetes or other things. But if something happened in the critical ones, like internal and scalper like itself, it's like a, how it works. Uh, like a, it's just like a full lag situation. Of yeah, maybe it, it, like one mechanism you could apply okay. there to more uh, secure support. Yeah. yeah. So for scalper itself, in terms of high availability and all that, when, when our uh, customers ask for high availability, we recommend they have two routers that will that will work as high availability for each other. So if one router goes down, the other takes over. The example we've seen, we only had one router, right? Very simple application. But we also have some performance benchmarks on how many router, how many cores, not how many routers, how many cores a router must be deployed on so that it can satisfy the number of calls. But if one really goes down, our HA setup is we recommend having two routers per site. So site meaning uh, site could be an environment like our RHEL, IWS Azure, or on a cluster, it could be a namespace. So you could have a network titan namespace just like, just like our data center and say, no ingress into the namespace, but I will only allow communication through scopper. So you can have that, but so typically for HADR, that's, we have two routers distributed and, and we, we can actually allocate the number of cores on your nodes that the routers will use to satisfy the minimum performance requirements. And, and, and full honesty, right? We are going through a couple of hops in the network. And there is latency, but we've seen very minimal latency. There is, there is some performance benchmarks that we'll publish later in the year, but if I say no latency, that anybody is lying who's, who's doing that over a network. So, I hope I answered your question.